Here we are, Location Lux. I'm your host, Alan Canis, and here in season one, we'll be focused on what we're calling the Great Lifestyle Migration. On each episode, I'll be right here in San Francisco, Silicon Valley. Over the last few decades, we've witnessed a great migration for employment and technology development. As such, the need and demand for homes has been among the highest in the country. These migration choices are giving people an extraordinary opportunity to explore new locations, amenities, and lifestyle options. And that's why we're here. Location Lux. And this week, I'm so pleased to welcome another one of my favorite real estate colleagues, Pollyanna Snyder, direct from Montana. Pollyanna, thank you so much for joining us today. Alan, thanks so much for having me. It's, it's a pleasure to speak to you. I'm here in Bozeman, Montana today, where we're having all weather patterns. It's perfect for spring skiing, and, and we have snow. It's snowing right now over the Bridger Mountains, and, and the sun's coming out to the west. So I'm in a panoramic spot right now where I can see about 100 miles in every direction. Pollyanna, today we're going to talk about how not only is Montana a destination location, but it's a beautiful lifestyle. But before we do that, I would love it if you would take a moment to talk a little bit about you and your business. Absolutely. And again, thanks for having me. I've been in Bozeman now for about 12 years. Uh, I grew up in the military. I'm originally from Kentucky and Virginia and um, met my husband and had my children in Southern California, which is where I began my real estate career in South Orange County, primarily the Laguna Beach, Dana Point, San Clemente area. Left there in 2006, and I have since practiced real estate in North Carolina, uh, Telluride, Colorado, and I moved here 12 years ago where I began my residential practice here in Bozeman. So being in Montana, you know, people want to hear interesting stories. Just tell us about the horseshoe story. Well, in fact, I happened to bring it with me, and I'm going to show it to you in just a second. So Bozeman is, a, is an old Western town, you know, really de began to develop after the Civil War. And uh, last summer, outside of our office, we had two, we, we work on a corner down here, and one of the original and older streets in Bozeman, and they dug it up. They were replacing water and sewer pipes. And we had these enormous 20 to 25 foot trenches out in front of our office. And one day I'm walking up to the front door and sitting on the sidewalk is this horseshoe. And I thought, oh my gosh, that's fascinating. You can just look at it and see the age and the curve of it. And I brought it inside our office and I set it down on our conference room table. Well, one of our colleagues is an avid horseman, rancher, fly fisherman, you know, Chip's fabulous. He's your quintessential six foot three, 10 gallon hat advisor at our office. And he walks in and he sees his horseshoe sitting on the conference room table. And immediately he said, number one, he said, that is a hand forged horseshoe. He said, I'm gonna tell you right now, that horseshoe's probably from around the late 1800s, early 1900s. And he said also that comes from a very large horse. So maybe some sort of a draft horse uh, Clydesdale or Percheron coming up and down the street, you know, hauling crates and freight up and down the town of Bozeman when it was, it was just dirt roads. And I understand that you have another great piece of history. You have Mr. Gary Cooper. Absolutely. Most people don't realize <laughs> that Gary Cooper was from Montana. We do commemorate Mr. Cooper. There is a, we have a lovely theater downtown called the Ellen Theater, and there is a star on the sidewalk for Gary Cooper downtown. Oh, that's great. So let's start talking about real estate. Great. How many times have people come up to you and give or given you a call regarding purchasing the John Dutton Ranch? <laughs> well, <laughs> once a week, maybe. Um, <laughs> obviously with the advent, when the, when the show, when Kevin Costner brought uh, the show Yellowstone uh, to television, it was an enormous hit. And, um, you know, I call it the Dallas uh, of our of the 80s. You know, Yellowstone is our Dallas, what Dallas was back in the 80s. And uh, we frequently get that request. Um, in fact, we own five offices here in the area. And we have very five distinctive areas just within driving distance around us. We have Bozeman. We have Big Sky, just about 50 miles to the south. And we have Livingston. 
just about 35 miles to the east. Now, that is where the story of Yellowstone takes place, is down in the Paradise Valley. So in particular, when that show debuts in July, our website hits go up about 40%. Uh, wow. with folks looking at the Bozeman and, you know, Livingston, Paradise Valley area. But that is the question that we receive a lot is, you know, where's the John Dutton Ranch and, and how can I buy that? So where are people coming from? Where are they migrating from? Now, prior to COVID, we had a lot of folks coming from California and Colorado. Since COVID hit, that has really expanded a lot to Seattle, uh, Portland. We probably see more Northern California than we do Southern California, but we have a healthy number of folks coming from Southern California and um, Arizona and even Texas. And the East Coast, I can't tell you the number of folks I've helped just from the Atlanta area or, you know, the the Georgia, South Carolina markets. And I think one of the biggest things that really buoys um, Bozeman's foundation, its economy is an incredible university that we have. Montana State is amazing. It has business and economics, engineering, agriculture. It's more of the engineering and, and ag school in the state of Montana. And its president and its community has just built an incredible foundation. And that draws a lot of folks here. And that brings events, cultural events, to a town of Bozeman size that we wouldn't normally have if we didn't have a strong university. So we've had anyone from Mountain John and Def Leppard to uh, Kenny Chesney's coming to visit us this summer. Can you talk to us a little bit about what price points people can expect? That's another great question, Alan. You know, it all has to do with supply and demand. And our demand far exceeds our supply. And right now, depending upon what someone wants to purchase, if maybe they want a couple of acres, and I'm gonna say somewhere between maybe 10 to 20 acres, and they'd love a lovely custom home on it, they may be looking in the high 1 million to three and a half million range. For okay. your, I always used to say our sweet spot in Bozeman was maybe that oh, 350 to 750 range, anywhere from a, a condominium to a, a really nice home downtown. And so our median price right now of homes in Bozeman is probably in the $460,000 range. We've been discovered by a lot of folks. And so that is really impacting our supply and demand. Can you tell us a little bit about the architectural designs? How has that changed through the years? So um, I just sold a home, a historic home in downtown Bozeman that was built in 1912. And our historic area of town, which is just kind of south of our main street, our our lovely downtown corridor, you're going to find a lot of homes built in the early, some in the late 1800s to early 1900s. We do have sections of downtown that were really built in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. Surrounding Montana State is a, a very mix of architectural styles from old and historic and Victorian to more of that mid-century modern that we have to offer. And and some of the homes that were not of quality built and not of historic nature have been either renovated significantly and really taken down to their studs and some have even had to be removed. And so newer homes have been built and you start to see more of that, what I call that mountain modern. Uh, You'll see a little bit more angles to those homes and slanted roofs and very charming, very, uh, very conscious on the use of space because they are older historic lots downtown. So very conscious about the use of space, both inside and outside. Pollyanna, talk to us about your seasonal activities. So we have an array of winter sports, uh, which includes skiing, snowshoeing, you know, cross-country skiing, downhill skiing. Here in Bozeman, we have uh, Bridger Bowl, which is just, I'm standing here actually looking at it right now, which is 
maybe 15 minutes, you're on the ski slopes. And then to the south of us, just about 50 miles, we have Big Sky, which Big Sky is the largest uh, terrain ski resort in the United States. So yes, snowmobiling, uh, ice climbing, ice skating. I'm a, I happen to be a rabid hockey mom. Both my children play hockey. And there's figure skating. There's now curling. We have a curling league, and Bozeman has wow. the largest adult hockey league in the state. In the summertime, we are, you know, we're a world-renowned hotspot for fly fishing. We have three forts to the west of us, which is the confluence of the Gallatin, Madison, and Jefferson Rivers. Hiking, biking, kayaking, canoeing. Um, I mean, the summer here is just exceptional. So let's talk a little bit, Pollyanna, about your appreciation. How has that been year after year with the home values there? Oh, that is that is the never ending question. Our appreciation <laughs> has been, quite frankly, through the roof. Um, prior to COVID, we saw a healthy eight to 10 percent a year. In some of our market sectors right now, we're seeing as high as 21% a year. Pollyanna, what condition may a buyer expect a home to be in when they're looking in Montana? Well, you know, I don't know that it's all that different from your market. Of course, we're in a seller's market. Now, I always prepare my sellers, though, to have that house and that property in as top a shape as possible in order to garnish you know, garner the highest dollar per square foot for that property. So we all, our, our industry as a whole here, we do work really hard to prepare our sellers to put those homes in an, in top condition, just so that they can garner that, that highest dollar. So you're gonna see things, you know, very, typically you're gonna see things very well maintained, uh, staged in some aspects. And, um, you know, they want to put their best foot forward. That's good to hear. And Pollyanna, how easy is it to get in and out of Montana flight-wise? So the Bozeman Airport is the largest airport in the state of Montana. Uh, I think I looked yesterday and we have approximately 26 direct flights, um, LA being one of those. San Francisco being one of those cities that we have direct flights to. And just last week, uh, Southwest Airlines um, announced that they're going to be flying into Bozeman starting in May of this year. So we do have the busiest airport in the state. So that is also allowing people to move here and they can work full time. If they need to travel for work, you know, it's a very easy flight, one flight or two flights to be anywhere in the country. Pollyanna, are there tax savings in Montana? Montana does not have a sales tax. Uh, we do have property tax and we do have income tax, but we do not have sales okay. tax. But one thing that is very important to your viewers is the fact that Montana is a non-disclosure state. We're about one of six states in the U.S. that are non-disclosure states, which means what you pay for your property is not disclosed in any way, shape, or form. That's actually a nice feature, very nice feature to have. Pollyanna, thank you so much for joining us on today's episode, Location Lux. Alan, thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to share Montana with everyone, and I look forward to having you personally visit here soon.
Welcome to Metropolis Sustainable Product Spotlight. I'm senior editor, Kelly Beeman. Today, we're taking a look at Velar Bio, the first ever collection of high performance fabrics made using renewable plant-based ingredients. That means Velar Bio has a top layer made partly from corn-based content and a back cloth that incorporates a wood pulp-based material. These two ingredients, have helped earn the textile a 29% bio-preferred label from the United States Department of Agriculture and third-party certification from SCS Global Services for indoor air quality at the Advantage Gold level. Its manufacturer, Ultra Fabrics, has 20 years of expertise engineering high-performance textiles. For that reason, this product is also Healthier Hospitals Initiative compliant. Joining me to tell us what led to the development of Velar Bio and how Ultra Fabrics is achieving its own circular economy are Nicole Meyer, the company's director of branding, and Corey Skult, associate director for corporate citizenship, which is a sustainability consultancy. Thank you for having us. Thank you, Kelly. Great to be here. Nicole, maybe you can start us off and tell us something about the steps that have led up to this product. Yeah, um, so as you mentioned, you know, Ultra Fabrics is known for our innovation, uh, which is based in our state-of-the-art Japanese engineering. And so our goal is to always combine sustainability, comfort, and performance, and just, you know, really elevate that through great textures, beautiful color offering, and so over six years ago, we took on the challenge of reducing our dependence on fossil fuels um, and, and creating Velar Bio. So we partnered with a local supplier of resins, uh, began testing and developing that. Um, and the reason for that was just feedback from the, the market and the field. We work in a lot of different industries. Um, and so we have a lot of different requests coming at us from um, our customers and their demands. And so we kind of took on that challenge of, you know, reducing our dependency on fossil fuels, but maintaining the performance and hopefully just moving the whole category of polyurethane forward uh, towards a more circular design process. I think that's really impressive. Maybe you can tell us a little more about the unique features of the material itself. Yeah, so as you mentioned, it has the corn-based resin and the wood pulp back cloth. Um, so it just reduces the dependence on uh, fossil fuels and all of that. And then additionally, it has a really beautiful texture, kind of a subtle surface interest that merges together a bit of a matte and a luminescence. Mm -hmm. um, and then finally, with the high performance part of it, it still is bleach cleanable. It could still be used for upholstery and, you know, high traffic commercial applications, as well as, you know, accessories, apparel, and vertical surfaces. It's very innovative. It's, it's, it, we've talked about this a little <laughs> bit before we got on the interview of how, how difficult it is to have the chemistry work out so that the, you get the performance that you need and have it, you know, feel healthy, you know, for indoor air quality and, you know, all around. Exactly. Um, next question, um, Corey, can we talk about the different ways um, that you've been working with the company to innovate uh, when it comes to renewable and recycled material contents? Um, how do these approaches fit into the, the broader plan or approach that Ultra yeah. Fabrics has? Absolutely. So I, I think, you know, the circular economy and, and these bio-based materials have been kind of a hot topic in, uh, in textiles, particularly in fashion for a while. Um, but they're often approached in a kind of ad hoc way, one initiative, one product. And I think what's really special about uh, what we've been able to do Ultra Fabrics is to really embed it in a, a more uh, comprehensive sustainability strategy. Um, so looking even in the, the realm of circular economy and kind of circular materials, recognizing uh, that can't be uh, addressed in isolation. It's really part of a systematic approach that's looking at the inputs, looking at you know, increasing the use of, of both renewable materials and recycled materials in products. Um, and that's happening across several product lines now. And uh, looking at um, kind of the, the use phase, how can we increase 
um, the length of time that people are using these products through durability and timeless design um, to make sure they're not becoming waste. And then at the end of life, how can we uh, look for second life cycles and opportunities to kind of divert excess inventory for new and kind of creative uses? Um, so really looking at from systematic approach and, and addressing all the facets of circularity and of sustainability more broadly. Awesome. And Nicole, how, how, does, how do these efforts for Ultra Fabrics compare with uh, the competitors? Well, I mean, in the, in the case of Velar Bio, it is a very unique product. There isn't anything that's comparable to it. Um, but as, as Corey said, when we take a step back and look at our holistic approach, um, I believe we're setting ourselves up to be a leader um, because we're not just looking at one aspect of it. Uh, so for example, you know, our end of life, we are really putting effort into upcycling our material. And mm -hmm. so we introduced a program uh, a few years back called Motenai. Um, and that is the Japanese concept of finding value in what others would consider waste. And so we've been able to divert 30,000 yards to local communities, to art organizations, to uh, you know students, things like that, um, which is really exciting. And then, really importantly, looking at our mill has been a big part of it as well. Um, not you know just being an animal-free, bio-based material isn't enough. We want to make sure that we're making the products as cleanly and as safely as possible. So, looking at you know really viable uh, alternatives to the solvents and ingredients that we use now. Um, looking at our carbon footprint, you know, installing solar panels. So there's many different ways, um, which is all kind of supporting our, our steps towards being leaders. In this. And it sounds like the approach is very data driven as well. Um, you you're introduced your first sustainability report. Can you uh, share some of the highlights of that? Yeah, so yeah, we just introduced it a couple of weeks back, which is really exciting for us. Um, and so some of the highlights so if we're looking at like our water use, for example, knowing that water use is, is a big part of textile production, we have been able to uh, reduce our use of fresh water by, you know, five to 10%. Um, and that's just in one process where we've been able to recycle it. So it's really exciting. And that five to 10% is about 3.2 million gallons of water saved. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a great significant step forward. Um, our uh, waste intensity, we reduce that by 10%, you know, through uh, just returns, lowering that, our Motenai program, various things. Um, our, our carbon footprint, you know, we confirmed our uh, plan to install solar panels. Okay. Um, is there anything else I'm missing, Corey? <laughs> yeah, I think it's really the culmination of, uh, you know, not just writing this report, but of the work that the company's been doing over the past two years to really establish the right uh, metrics to measure environmental and social performance um, and to really track consistently over time. So um, I see this report as both uh, kind of an output of that process, but also one that's really being used to, to drive change and continuous improvements across the company and, and help us focus on where the biggest impact can be made. Awesome. Um, just uh, so we don't forget, where can um, specifiers or um, clients find the report? So it's actually on our website. Um, so uh, ultrafabricsinc.com, we have uh, our sustainable future. So it's a whole landing page dedicated to that where you can find the full report. Great. And, you know, certainly you're doing this in the context of, um, I mean, this growing, like this landscape of, of many companies um, who make interior products, who make exterior products, all of them sort of focusing on the same uh, points, you know, and trying to trying to improve, you know, their performance. What do you think of this, this sort of broader, well, what's the, what, what's driving the industry? I mean, certainly we are, you know, people are aware of reducing their carbon footprint, but it seems that there are um, specific areas like for cutting, reducing waste, uh, you know, and focusing on water conservation. How, how is this becoming standardized, I guess? Yeah, so I think a lot of folks uh, may have thought that a you know, year of crises like 2020 would push sustainability off the agenda, but in fact, we've seen 
uh, the, the expectations rising across the board. So 83% of consumers uh, said that just recently that they consider the environmental and social impact of their products. Uh, and that's a slight increase from pre-COVID. And uh, it really just shown a spotlight on uh, the responsibility of companies to um, to manage uh, responsibly their environmental impact, the, the way they take care of the health and well-being of their employees and customers and communities. Um, so our hope is that, you know, in the long term, uh, we really raise the bar for everyone. So by publishing a really transparent sustainability report, um, by, by sharing uh, the, the innovation uh, that we're able to achieve, uh, hoping that that kind of raises the bar for everyone and and drives the whole industry forward. Um, but there's really, uh, there's a lot of big challenges <laughs> that everyone manufacturing textiles is facing. Uh, and the more that we can kind of be open about how we're tackling those challenges, I think the, the further we all move along. And what is the role of um, suppliers in that? It's, it's interesting from my work, working with a range of companies, we've seen a real shift in the past few years of brands really expecting more from, from their suppliers. So it used to be more consumer focused brands that were kind of talking about their sustainability strategy. And now the effort is really to, um, to bring suppliers uh, along as partners in that process. So suppliers are essential for, uh, for companies to meet their sustainability goals and suppliers are getting more innovative um, in the way the Ultra Fabrics is, is doing, not just being reactive to an existing uh, customer demands, but really bringing those innovations to customers and saying, hey, here's how we can take this further together. Well, I think it's it's very refreshing and, and so important that textiles can be cleanable and healthy uh, to be around. It's so critical, especially now with more indoor products, manufacturers working to reduce their carbon footprint as, as you guys are. Um, so it's great to now have this option of a bio-based upholstery uh, that also delivers it sounds like a contract grade performance. We're, we're wanting to make sure that we maintain, you know, uh, practicality for commercial applications. You know, having something that's bio-based that isn't enduring doesn't make sense, but we're not just kind of stopping there. We, we've set some really ambitious goals. So, you know, by 2025, we would like for 50% of our product introductions to have bio-based or recycled resources. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, by 2030, that goal is increasing to 100% of, of products with items evaluated along the way. So we were, we're working on materials that have recycled back cloths that will be out um, in the near future. Uh, we're looking and, and beyond just that also just like I said, safer chemistry. So coming up with some swaps to ingredients that will be happening or that's already happening. Um, so just, you know, just really excited to kind of keep this train moving forward. I think it sounds exciting. Well, textiles that are cleanable and healthy to be around are so critical, especially as more manufacturers of indoor products work to reduce their carbon footprints. So it's great to now have this option of a bio-based upholstery that delivers a contract grade performance. Thank you for joining us for Metropolis Sustainable Product Spotlight with Ultra Fabrics. Hello, I'm Mary Jo Bowling, a homes editor at Lux Interiors and Design. Welcome to Collab Lab by Design TV. Now today we're featuring a collaboration between Andrew Palachek, Chief Creative Officer at Palachek, and Jeffrey Allen Marks, founder of Jeffrey Allen Marks Incorporated. Andrew produces furniture inspired by natural materials. 
Jeffrey is an influential designer of interiors that are fresh, informal, and playful. So clearly, this partnership was meant to be. Now, Andrew, I know that Palachek is extremely selective about designers they partner with. So why this partnership? Hi, Mary Jo, how are you? I'm well, thank you. Uh, thanks for doing this, really appreciate it. Uh, this partnership uh, really came to be uh, because we, we were looking for, for somebody to really help us pull our, our designs and our merchandising, uh, the way that he designs and the way that he has, has lived uh, really is, is so informed by, by the coast and the beach and, and being, being informed by those, those lifestyles without being literal coastal. Uh, and, and that is, is really a perfect match for our brand being, being natural material inspired and nature inspired. Um, and so it was, it was a very easy yes when, when we first met, what was it, six, seven years ago by now? Yeah, it's almost eight years ago, I, I believe. Wow. Yeah. Well, yeah. speaking of inspiration, Jeffrey, what inspires your work for Palachek? You know, historically, um, I have always loved these rooms that are, you know, have this formality to them, but also have this casualness mixed in. And I think it started, you know, with the English so, so many years ago, um, you know, the woven materials, all the beautiful willows they used and all the use of wicker in, you know, rooms that were more formal. So um, I have always loved that infused sort of look in a house. And I think Palachek was the perfect opportunity to expand on that. You said that you've been at this for eight years. Everything evolves and changes. How have the collections changed over the last several years? My gosh, I think they just get better and better. Uh, you really, you learn a little bit more each and every launch about what resonates in the market, um, a, a little bit more minimal. The designs uh, hopefully are more and more refined, uh, always inspired by natural, but, but I think that, that as you learn um, where the pieces are placed, the various homes, the beaches, the city lofts, the, uh, the traditional spaces, transitional spaces, you just, you just get a little bit more refined with each and every new design uh, as it comes out. And the fun part is, is to, to make the next collection better than the one before. Um, and that never stops. What do you think, Jeffrey? You know, it's funny. I think historically, before I even had my collection at Palachek, I still use the president's collection that I didn't design, but I love it. You know, I put it on, you know, anywhere from a sunroom to I, I use it on covered at exteriors. Um, I still love to use that traditional side of, of, of Palachek, but I think where where we've evolved is a little cleaner, as Andrew's saying, a little um, pared down. And I think that's what people are asking for in the market, but I think it still works in a traditional interior. It's a nice mix. It's a nice pop of, you know, a little bit more contemporary, um, you know, chair or accessory or whatever it might be in the corner. Um, yeah, be, right behind me, I have one of my vases that just arrived yesterday from Palachek. So, uh, you know, they work, we have them outside here in the Hamptons and we also have them inside. So it's a nice way to, uh, you know, mix it up. You know, I think mm -hmm. we're all living outside more. So, um, you know, it's a nice way to, you know, do either or. Very cool. Well, you mentioned that you had some favorites. Let's talk about your favorites from the collection, both the current one and the past. Jeffrey, what are some of your favorites in the in the collections that you've designed for this company? Well, you know, my I still my go to and I use it for almost every client is my rope bed. I love the rope canopy bed. Um, I use just the bed without the canopy all the time. Um, I love some of the chairs I've done. And I think I see them in a lot of commercial interiors, which is really kind of fun when you walk into a restaurant, you see, you know, something you design times 50. Um, so that's fun. Um, and I think some of the lighting that we've done recently, some of the lamps are just, I mean, top notch, really, really fun. And I'm loving, you know, specking them for clients, you know, in different environments and how they work and how they mix and match. 
Andrew, what are some of your standouts? It's really hard to pick. I agree with Jam. I think the wood side bed, uh, the, the woven rope bed is, is incredible. And we were able to do that in two different finishes, which was, which was a really challenging thing to do with, with uh, introducing color into to natural materials. That's not always, always easy to do with Avoca. Uh, I love the Menlo chair very much. I love the Capistrano, the brand new Brentwood uh, with pierced jute rope and mahogany is another favorite. Um, it's, it's really hard to choose, but all of the all of the pieces really have an easy breezy sort of relaxed feeling to them uh, that that for me jam when when I think of your spaces and the way that you live that's that's certainly a, a thread that is is common and um, and each time they just get better than than the last so it's it's really hard to choose a favorite uh, I, I love them all very much I love some of the uh, this time we did some extensions we did the extension to the Melrose chair which I love, 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 have a couple yeah. of them in my own house. And we did the um, the dining chair version of that. And we also extended on the Santa Barbara collection, which is one of my favorites as well. And I use yeah. it, I, I use it all over the place, whether it be the mountains or the, uh, or the city, it, it doesn't necessarily have to stay in Santa Barbara. Jeffrey, as a designer, it's not just your role to create or design the furniture, you have to actually put it in interior. So how do you envision these pieces being used in someone's home? You know, I, I think, as I said earlier, I'm, I mean, even my most formal city interiors, I always drop some pallet check in because I think it, it tones it down and it's definitely my vibe of you know, let's not be too fussy with this house. Let's, you know, kind of take it in a more relaxed. And, you know, Wicker historically is, has always been so, you know, romantic. And so, you know, there was something about it that just relaxed people. And it, you know, people ask me, you know, how do you make, how do I make my city apartment feel like a beach house? Well, I think something like Palachek, just bringing that in all of a sudden, gives you a little bit of that casualness and that for informality that we're all craving these days. Now, you both have some things in common. Both of you are California natives, both of you are California residents. So what about this collection is uniquely Californian and how does that translate to the rest of the world? Well, I think Mary Jo that the whole world now because of everything you know we're going through, wants that California look. They want it more, you know, I, I think people still want a tailored interior, but they want a more relaxed California look and it's bigger than ever. I'm seeing it, you know, shopping in London. I'm seeing Palachek now scattered throughout, you know, some of the best showrooms and interior design firms. It's scattered in and out because they want that casualness, that laid back feeling. And all of a sudden, boom, there you go. You know, it, all it takes is a, is a couple Palachek pieces in a room to achieve that. What do you think, Andrew? Well, being born and raised in, in California, but then traveling everywhere, uh, California is a big, big influence. Uh, but we really try to make the pieces familiar. The, the shapes should not say too many. Too, too, um, we try and have pretty clean lines with things. Uh, we try and have a refinement to how we, how we uh, finish the natural materials. And so this allows these pieces just about any home. And I think there's a, a casualness and a, and a relaxed vibe that, that so many folks are looking for in their spaces. Uh, but really, I believe there can be a, a piece of natural inspired furniture in every single house in the world. Um, I think it has a place in, in almost every design, almost every every home in the world um, if it's if it's if it's styled uh, just right if you if you pick the right interior designer the right way to style these pieces um, there can be a little piece of, of natural inspiration in every single home I agree yeah I, agree. I mean we can all use some nature and relaxation right <laughs> so you know let's talk about the future you're coming up it won't be long before it's 10 years so what's the future of Jeffrey Allen Marks at Palachek we're, we're looking to get better and better each time, as I've said, and, um, 
And so there are always some pieces that we that we work on that that didn't quite turn out. Uh, you know, we don't we don't launch anything that we we um, that, that's not ready. Um, and and every time there are always some pieces that that didn't quite didn't quite make it. So um, and, and the the collection the collaboration is 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 very much ongoing and and never stops. And so we're always looking at. The ideas you look at the archive of ideas and and there are so many and so how do we make it um make these pieces that didn't quite work how do we refine them go back to the drawing board and, and it's so, so fun it's if, if you've ever been to the warehouse there's all these things that we've started over the years and you know i wake up at night and think about them and how i can make them better and uh you know it's just an archive of you know 10 years of things that you know we've we've come pretty close, but not to perfection yet. And I think that's the fun thing about going to the warehouse and seeing these, you know, I've forgotten some of the things, you know, over the years, but they're still great. They're just, you know, there's a time and a place. Yeah. So Well, Jeffrey, what is new, brand new that hasn't been seen yet that you're dreaming about, that you're thinking about? <laughs> well, it's funny. I mean, I go back to my original, you know, the Palachuk uh, family was so kind when I started all of this and they kind of let me experiment and th some things just flat out did not work but um it's fun to sort of re-envision them um you know there's so much you know i i think design is bigger than ever uh, today i mean between the real estate market and everything that's happening these stores are so busy and people are thriving to make their houses better so it's such an amazing time for design and Palachuk to, you know, collaborate and to think about the future. Well, so. I can't wait to see what comes next. Andrew and Jeffrey, thank you so much for joining us today. It was really interesting to hear about the current collection and what's coming up in the future. And we can't wait to see what comes next. And I wanna thank everybody for watching Design TV. You can always join us here for Design is an Inspiration.